That's a very important effort. Okay? Because what you can do is to delay the other people right? by hiring everybody that can do, that can build an alternative. Not that this is a game that, this is actually a, a, a good observation because this is a game that many dominant firms play. Especially in the, in the internet industry or in the software creation, there's a lot of, or historically there's been a lot of trying to buy out each other. You know, small first, small innovator gets purchased by the big guy. Same is true in the pharmaceutical. Big pharma tends to buy small innovating firms by appropriating pattern R&D, but also that's a way of getting researchers and minimize the chance that somebody comes in in your line of business and challenges you, okay? So this effort is, is very much there. I think, in fact, it's an effort that one wants to study more carefully. Why? Because it has a second implication, which is what Roberto and others are studying, and I've seen that there is a more recent literature as well. And too bad Roberto never finished his paper, started more than 10 years ago, back in 2005. And the argument is, well, think at this same game and think at the monopolist and a bunch of competitors there on the back at various distance. So some at distance t minus 1, some at t minus 2, and so on, right? And they're all trying to catch up. It's clear that in a model like that, it's natural to drive the cost of catching up as an increasing function of distance. So that when you're far enough, you give up. Because the expected payoff is always less than the expected cost. In a, in a setting like that, it's an incentive for the monopolist to try to stay ahead. This is not there in the usual arrow argument. Arrow is not having that in mind. That's the key thing. Monopolies may innovate for a while to make the distance between them and the potential competitors so large that after that all competitors break off. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, yeah, break down and, and stop competing. At that point, you stop innovating because now you're a monopolist. The probability one. Right. So it's clear that you can write this model in all kind of ways. So the interesting thing here is to be able to elaborate a model that has a degree of grip on facts out there. Because we have observation over history of the last 50, 60 years that go either way. Right? For a long time, there were been industries that were completely monopolized, there was no entry. But there was not really technological superiority, it was mostly legal thing. On the other hand, in some cases, it, it appeared to be superior, IBM. Right? There was a market for mainframe in which two, three players controlled everything for a long time, and nobody else was coming in. Personal computer was the, big, the lateral breakthrough, but it took half a century to, to revolutionize it. So there are examples like that, and in fact they resemble this more, they're very, very rare, in which the monopolist has become a monopolist because of huge technological advantage, and uh, an innovator, alternative innovator come in, but only after a long period of time. On the other hand, it's much more frequent to see phenomena in which a monopolist become monopolist and stay so for a long time when there is legal protection. But market for drugs are like that. In market for drugs, big farmers have a lot of segmentation of the market and niches. I take care of your liver, you take care of my brain, that takes care of uh, stomach, uh, kidney, blood pressure, whatever, okay, cholesterol. It's, uh, there is overlap, I mean, no, no agreement is perfect, but there's a lot of market segmentation which is protected by legal data. So this is a, an applied argument that is worth studying. Right? What's the role of legal protection in permitting leaders to take advantage and stay ahead forever? Okay, so uh, that's, that's one the point. Huh? This is the argument you were led. No, no, that's not the argument me and Levin use. Well, I mean, it's one of the side arguments, but it's not the argument we use. No, no, that argument is, is different. This is stuff, as I, I mean, they, the first person with whom I discussed this was uh, this, this, this person, uh, Roberto Piazza. Uh, he, 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 wrote, he worked on that for a bit, and then he got into a different career in other places, and he left that paper aside. I know he has taken it up again. But I've noticed that uh, there's been a couple of other authors, I forgot the names, that have been working on, on this. Because it's a natural issue. 
it's a natural applied issue to try to understand in different segments of industry what are the implications of having a lead and having innovation that are sequentially ordered so that someone may take a lead large enough that the other don't run anymore. It's, it's a very natural question. It's both relevant and theoretical, but it's relevant empirically in terms of policy. Right? In terms of policy, because you understand, that's depending on which interpretation you have of antitrust role, right? this is a situation which you may or may not want to step in. So think, for example, this is a debate where David and I disagree, right? And it's an evaluation debate. We've had this debate a few times. I claim that in tools such as Facebook, that is social interaction devices, uh, or some of the search things like Google, we are facing a situation like that. The dominant firm is so far ahead of the other that the chances of uh, uh, having competition there are becoming very small. David argument says, well, you know, that was true for mainframes too, and then the PC came. My counter argument, yes, was, yeah, but that took 30 years or 40 years, so I'm not sure I want to wait that long. Okay? Fine, it's a debate. Well, I'm saying I'm not going to reproduce because David is not here. If he were here, he would have much better argument than I'm uh, representing. Okay? But it's a debate. So, uh, you know, there are days in which I wake up and say, look, this social interaction tool a la Facebook have become almost public utilities. I mean, some of this controversy over their censorship and their being manipulated and blah, 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 suggests that there is a degree. And they're making a lot of profits out of monopoly position. Maybe an antitrust action is overdue. Uh, some other days you think, well, my young students, you know, my college student, Wu Xu, explained to me just before coming here, a couple of their researchers that I was an old elephant, they don't use Facebook anymore. That was not true. All their PCs had Facebook on during class time. Uh, and they are all on Snapchat and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Yes, maybe other social are competing with Facebook for uh, share of the market. There is no doubt, but then from that point of view, also the movies are competing with Facebook because it's a free time thing. And Garda Land and Disneyland and the mountain and going to the seaside and swimming is competing with Facebook. It's a way of. Uh, using your uh, uh, your leisure time uh, at the end, right? Uh, but that's too weak an argument to say that uh, uh, there is competition in the market for uh, for social. But I stop here. Anyhow, what I'm saying is the argument is not trivial, and it is of policy relevance, and it requires some new thinking because some of these tools uh, that have come around are different from what we have. Some of them have, in my opinion, a natural. Uh, desire to become utilities, to become standardized, and to uh, be natural monopoly. Things like, uh, again, this damn Facebook is, uh, in my view, a almost natural monopoly in the same way that, you know, the square in the town used to be the natural monopoly for meeting uh, in the old days, right? And that's the natural monopoly for meeting. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. All I'm saying is it's an argument worth uh, thinking about. Okay, all right, so that's for that part of, of the model. Now, now that it, the, the, the thing is clear, let's start thinking, and, and this is stuff I ask you as, I'm gonna put to you as questions more than, first of all, think of the dynamics the model describes. So we can see the story. The story here is a way of saying monopoly is not bad uh, because uh, uh, because it's the thing that allows, so that's the first statement. First statement, monopoly is not necessarily bad because its profits create the incentive for innovation. And given that it's possible that one monopolist overcome the other, then we have dynamic efficiency, as people call it, terrible name. But anyhow, we have a sequence of innovation, okay? And that's the benefit, that's the gains of the cost of monopoly, all right? Uh, doubts, two, one empirical, one theoretical. Theoretical, well, here the only thing that matters is actually the profits, not the monopoly. To the extent the profits come from scarcity of one form or another, from first mover advantage, from anything, all right, then I may have the benefits, that is, 
sequencing of innovation, people overcoming each other. Without the cost, if I let people copy, I take away monopoly, or I find ways of minimizing the monopoly power, uh, given the profits will come around again. We'll, we'll, we'll look at this in a moment. So that's the theoretical objection. The empirical one, show me. What's the example? Because clearly this is the, mo this is the model of an industry, right? Of a market, of a segment of a market. May I see, can you point me to relevant mass of examples where the world uh, works like that? See what I mean? Can you point me to a market for bread, for shoes, for PC, for medicines, for... Yeah, you tell me, okay? In which I can see for an extended period of time that there is a lot of innovation and it comes in this form. One monopolist leapfrogging the other, jumping ahead of the other. Are at relatively high speed. I already gave you an example, but it doesn't work very well. It's the one for computer, right? So we had for a long time mainframe computing dominance, mostly IBM and a couple of smaller. And then we've had the, the laptop computer, I'm oh, sorry, laptop, the, the, the desktop or the, whatever you want to call it, the mini computer, right? Which has produced a lot of innovation, okay? Notice that in both cases there was little role for patenting, so there were no legal monopolies, right? It was mostly a, techno a big technological advantage, a market advantage that IBM had got on everybody else, right? And uh, later on, in fact, there was a gigantic amount of innovation and, uh, and surpassing and creation. You know, this object is so infinitely better than the first desktop I got in my life in 1981, I guess, 82 here uh, at Kafoskari when I was uh, getting a degree, that is just, you know, that is any cost less. And it's only 35 years ago, right, 36 years ago. Uh, but it's a product of a gigantic amount of competition. There's no dominant firm. There's at least worldwide, and they've changed over time, but there's always been, say, at least 10 competing companies producing these objects. Probably more if you look at the lower tail of the market, you know, but even if you look at the upper scale stuff that we use, it's always the choice of Toshiba, Dell, this and that, right? Hewlett Packard, uh, whatever, right? Mac, obviously, and, and so on. And they all competing with each other. So it doesn't fit the model, really. Right. So I'm thinking, is there another example? You know, in the software industry, I find zero. Zero, right? War is war. It's been war for 30 years and keeps being war. There's nobody. And all the office suite, all the stuff is there. And there are these fringe effort, and even if I've been a big supporter of Linux and then Ubuntu and then this and that, right? the fragment of the market. Um, do you have an example? Maybe photo cameras, for example, when there was Kodak with an instant photo, and then it became bankrupt from the digital photo. Right, okay, well, but Kodak, there was Kodak and Polaroid, well, there was Fujitsu, so it depends which market you have in mind. You have in mind the market for the actually pictures. film. Pictures. No, the film. the film. Kodak never had monopoly on on either cameras or anything. They had almost a monopoly with Fujitsu. It was Fujitsu, right, the other company. So that there were two or three producers of uh, film roles. Kodak was by far the biggest, right? right. And uh, they lasted for what? I don't know, forever, I guess, 50 years. And then in the 90s, digital camera killed it. Um, yeah, so that's one example. There was one, one sector where one, I, it, it, it reminds me a bit of the IBM with mini computer, right? There was a company or two that had such a gigantic dom market dominance, but probably they protected also their thing, the patents, I guess. Uh, even if many patents must have expired, but I'm sure Eastman Kodak had patents on their film processing technology, and they were dominant. You understand, I studied at Rochester, the University of Rochester, this is where Kodak was. It was really very huge, 
University of Rochester was very rich when I went there, which is why I could afford great. And the demise of Kodak was also the demise of the University of Rochester that has taken uh, 15 years of struggles to try to come back because they lost a lot of their endowment money, became very poor at certain point. Uh, okay, so that, that could be an example. That sector is involving Tachic knowledge, for example? Huh? Tachic knowledge. Uh, but Tachic knowledge is Tachic knowledge. What do you mean with Tachic knowledge? make you like the monopolist in a more... Give me an example. It's a kind of innovation that is not... Uh, you cannot uh, afford also with a important research because it's Tachic, so you cannot... Uh, which that person and makes that person, that person in the market, of course, the leader of the Oh, but that's exactly the opposite of this model. Besides, you're not going to have a sequence of innovators there, right? Exactly. It's the opposite. You asked for a... No, no, I want an example of the war. So the example she gave, in some sense, is at least one jump, right? This is a model of a sequence of jumps. So if I take that for the car industry, for example, what should I observe? I should observe leading companies changing continuously. Say, so now the problem is also, what does it mean a reasonable amount of time? How long is T? Five years? 10? 15? 20? Right? At some point in the paper, they try to calibrate, to, to use the model to interpret the business cycle, the growth cycle. Well, if I have to interpret the growth cycle, I need T to last no more than three, four, six years. Ten to make it very big. Right? So in order to have a representation of this in some reality out there, I should observe in a given very specific industry, say motorbikes or bikes, you know, people every seven, ten years overcoming and becoming the leading firm. And I have a hard time finding one. Jumps, we have a cell phone, we have Nokia, Blackberry, and Apple. We're reaching 12 years in each other. Uh, yeah, but as you notice, this is one way. Yeah, okay. After this this is uh, Google. Okay, but after this, uh, I'm going to explain it, but if you know that before we have Nokia, no, so we have uh, we have Motorola actually at the very beginning. Yeah. It's not an old industry. It's not an old industry. Yeah, but no, not at all. Not at all. In fact, that cell industry, there is a big difference between being the leader because you move first and being the monopolist. Okay? So let's uh, be clear here. 